All righty, it's a little bit after 2 p.m. on the East Coast, and we're going to start the Pratt webinar, the Pratt Applicant webinar for uh, 2020 application cycle. Uh, really glad to have you all here with us. And as a reminder, please mute yourselves. Uh, you are muted on entry, but please be sure to mute yourselves. So welcome to the Pratt Applicant webinar. Uh, my name is Kenny Gibbs. I direct the Pratt program uh, with my colleague, Dr. Desiree Salazar who is another program officer at NIGMS. And a reminder to please Thank everybody you. mute yourself. Uh, so please mute yourself. Thank you all so much. Um, and later in the presentation, we will be joined by four Pratt fellows, Dr. Sarah young Bear, Chase Francis, Aden Raleigh Gleason, and Elizabeth Martin, who will share their experience with the program. Um, before I get started, I do this with every webinar, uh, be sure to follow us at NIGMS training. Uh, the divisions of training, workforce development, diversity, as well as capacity building have a Twitter account where we hope to share information that's useful, like webinars like this um, and about how, and other training webinars. And you can use the hashtag NIGMS Pratt, and we will be sure to um, try to answer the questions either now or later. So for today's program, I'll do a little description on the Pratt program, and then I will talk about the application process and review. And then what's really exciting, we get to hear from Pratt fellows. And then, of course, we'll have your questions. And so I would like you to ask your questions through the chat function and direct those um, to me um, or Dr. Salazar, if you can see her um, in the chat box. But if not, just direct them to me, and I will um, answer the questions that you have. So first, I'll do a little background on the program. The Pratt program has been around for over 50 years, and it's a competitive three-year postdoctoral fellowship program that provides high quality research training in the basic biomedical sciences within NIH intramural research laboratory and prepares fellows for leadership positions in biomedical careers. So I'll break down that bullet point. Competitive means it's an opportunity to write a grant and um, obtain your own funding. It goes through peer review. There are many wonderful aspects of the intramural research program, the intramural program being work that's done on campus. Um, many people know NIH as a funding agency where we fund the research at thousands of institutions across the country, but we also have our own intramural research program. And this is an opportunity to work at the NIH as part of your postdoc. And the fellowship um, prepares fellows to take leadership positions in biomedical careers, be they academic, government, industry, or other science-related careers. NIGMS will provide you a stipend, health insurance, and a travel and training allowance for the three years that you're in the program. And so this is often a benefit, especially for fellows that are already here, because then they, um, but either way, you have your own independent funding. Um, as a Pratt fellow and as an, NIGMS post, as an NIH postdoc, you have access to the extensive NIH resources, which include top-notch facilities, expertise, opportunities to collaborate, as well as the Office for Intramural Training and Education. Um, and these slides will all be available on the Pratt website, and so you can look at the hyperlinks there. And we have a structured postdoctoral program with defined training components. Um, and so I'll talk about that briefly. Uh, we have a formal curriculum that has seven different areas of focus, which are seen here. Leadership, communication, networking, mentorship, biomedical ecosystem knowledge, diversity, and then service. And so as part of the Pratt program, we have a twice a month seminar series where Pratt fellows regularly meet with and learn from leaders in the biomedical research community, as well as develop professional skills that will help them to truly smoothly transition into leadership roles. Uh, so, for example, we have lunch twice a year with the NIGMS director, Pratt Fellows plan an annual scientific symposium where they bring leaders from the scientific community, um, as well as, as part of the seminar series, Pratt Fellows, during their second year, invite a speaker to the NIH campus, um, particularly um, in non-pandemic times, um, to network with the fellows and learn about their careers. Um, we also have different professional skills trainings like emotional intelligence, conflict resolution, or negotiation that can help you as you go forward. Communication is often um, important as well. And so in addition to the seminar series, where you communicate your science to a diverse group of scientists, uh, we do regular trainings on how to give a chalk talk, doing a three-minute talk, grant writing workshops, as well as other communications coaching. Networking is important, and so Pratt Fellows network on a regular basis with each other, scientific leaders through the seminar series, as well as with Pratt alumni. Mentorship is really important, and so in addition to having the mentor in your research lab, Pratt Fellows have mentorship from the Pratt program directors, that would be me and Dr. Salazar, as well as opportunity for mentorship and connection with NIGMS professional and scientific staff. 
we really want to make sure that you leave NIH knowing how the biomedical research enterprise works. And so as part of the seminar series, fellows are exposed to the NIH grant making process, through workshops on K awards, peer review, and we've even done uh, mock study sessions which we're planning to do um, in the next year as well, where fellows can do a mock review of K99 applications. Diversity is really important to the program, and so we know that diversity at all levels is integral to research and training excellence. And so Pratt fellows come from a wide variety of backgrounds, and professional development focuses on thinking how to work effectively in teams with colleagues from a wide variety of cultural and scientific backgrounds, as well as thinking about how to communicate to people in different backgrounds, whether they be in your discipline, across disciplines, or even the public. And finally, service is important. And so we know that to whom much is given, much is required. And so Pratt fellows have the opportunity and are expected to participate in a number of different service and outreach activities, be that the fellows committee at the NIH campus or the broader community. Uh, the fellows were planning uh, to participate in the NIGM and the USA Science Engineering Festival. It, of course, was canceled this year due to COVID concerns. But when that happens in a few years, we know the fellows will be participating in that as well. So these are some of the examples of how we build the curriculum for the Pratt program. This is a little bit more detail on that, and I'll just go through this slide really quickly, but we have a seminar series. We have speakers from across the country, again, mentioning practice chalk talk talks, three-minute talks, and different ways to have uh, important professional skills, as well as NIH funding workshops. Just a little more detail in this past year, for example, we kicked off the year with Dr. Hannah Valentine, who is the Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity at NIH, to really give a really important talk about diversity in science, why, how, and what roles NIH is taking to move the needle forward, both internally at, within the instrumental program, and importantly, in the extramural research community. We had a chat with Dr. Sharon Milgram, who is the head of the Office of Instrumental Training and Education, who really went through her own career path and how she um, has thought about attaining positions of leadership and what's important for fellows to think about. Um, and importantly, we were able to talk to early career scientists as well. So Dr. Olivia Rissland um, served on our advisory council for one round, and she graciously gave an opportunity to talk, came and took the opportunity to talk with the Pratt fellows about her own career and really how she found her position and now being a few years into the position, um, what she sees common errors that applicants make and how they can avoid that. We also have an annual scientific symposium, so this year we're really excited to have it on September 14th. This is planned by the fellows. The theme is going to be the bench to the market, and we're really excited to have Dr. Melissa Moore from Moderna Therapeutics, one of the companies leading the COVID vaccine trials, as well as Dr. Phil Sharp, um, a Nobel laureate, who will be talking about his experience there. So these are just some of the types of activities that you have access to and can plan as part, as part of the Pratt Fellowship. I'm often asked where Pratt alumni go. So this is just a quick slide showing that um, Pratt alumni go on to leadership positions in a number of different sectors. 38% go on to academic careers. 31% go on to careers in government. Uh, and that can include being a program officer or being an intramural uh, tenure track investigator at NIH or working at the FDA. About 20, a little more than 20% go on to careers in industry. And uh, the rest go on to other science related careers, be they science editing, science law, science policy, and really all the Pratt fellows are successful. And this is just an example that no matter what you want to do, Pratt can be an avenue that helps you get there. Altogether, 65% of recent fellows have uh, remained in career tracks where research was the primary activity. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Pratt application process and peer review. To be eligible for Pratt, you have to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. So this program mirrors our extramural F-32s, and again, it has to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident to be eligible for the Pratt Fellowship. The scientific focus is on all areas supported by NIGMS, which I will talk a little bit more about in just a moment, but we have a really broad mission. Um, and then the career stage is uh, for postdocs, and so if you are currently an NIH postdoc, you want you, we want you to have started no earlier than June 1st, 2019. So if you started at NIH after June 1st, 2019, you're eligible to apply. Also, we're really interested in recruiting graduate students to the NIH as part of this mechanism. And so if you are a graduate student who will begin your postdoc experience at NIH by the fall of 2021, um, I really want to encourage you to apply. And you can, again, reach out to me to think about timelines and if this, makes, if this is the right time to apply, but we really want you to apply um, even before you get here. We're especially interested in ensuring the applicant pool reflects the diversity of the biomedical 
PhD talent pool in terms of backgrounds, areas of science, et cetera. And so please apply. And I will tell you what my mother always told me, do not self-eliminate. If you're eligible, apply. You get great feedback on your scientific ideas as well as can help you moving forward um, in your career, no matter what you end up doing. So again, I say any area within the NIGMS research mission, and again, it's quite broad. It includes the things that are shown on the screen. Um, uh, I will just read them really quickly. Biological chemistry, biophysics, bioinformatics, cell and molecular biology, computational biosciences, developmental biology, genetics, immunology, neuroscience, pharmacology, physiology, and even technology development, and even more, right? The only things that tend to be outside of our mission that are still within the NIH mission are pure social behavioral studies um, or maybe pure population epidemiology. But again, biobehavioral is great, and the studies that connect population to molecular are also within the purview of the NIGMS mission for the purposes of the PrEP program. So again, um, many of you who are listening, I'm sure, will be able to um, find a find a mentor at NIH um, and find a home within the PrEP program. We currently, uh, sorry, to demonstrate that, we have PrEP fellows currently at 13 different ICs that are mentioned here and listed here. And so again, to make the point, NIG and this fund you, but you then do work with a mentor in another IC at the NIH campus. And so again, NIGMS funds fellows at NCI, NIAM, the Clinical Center, um, NIDDK, and all the ICs that are listed here. So if you're a grad student and you say, hey, I want to I wanna think about postdoc at the NIH, how do I find, how do I find a postdoc mentor? Um, again, this is where you go to the Intramural Research Programs website. So the NIH Intramural Program has approximately 1,200 investigators who can be identified by their scientific focus area or by name. The Office of Intramural Training Web Office of Intramural Training and Education, or OITE, also has a webpage of postdoc positions under the Career Services tab. And so that lets you know people who are looking for postdocs and who have funding available for those postdocs. A benefit of PRET is that you're able to have your own funding, but again, you want to know who has um, resources and who is looking. And then there are a list of people called intramural training directors. So each institute and center at NIH has their own dedicated uh, staff who focus on their intramural trainees, so the trainees that are on the NIH campus. And by looking at those people and connecting with them, um, they can be helpful in understanding the opportunities that are available at their institutes, as well as uh, the mentors, particularly those that have successful track records in transitioning postdocs to the careers that you're interested in. And so these are some different ways that you can think about identifying a mentor within the intramural program. And so now I'm going to talk about the Pratt application process. Pratt is a competitive application process, as I mentioned before. It uses the FI2 mechanism. So that's I for intramural, and that's an intramural version of the F32 with a couple of changes that are noted in the funding announcement. For all NIH funding purposes, you want to read everything thoroughly. Um, read the funding announcement and the associated guide notices, uh, which I'll get to in just a moment. There's specific guidance for each part of the application, which includes specific length, content, and due dates. This pro by applying through Pratt, you can either begin or continue your record of independent funding. And all Pratt program, all Pratt fellows are listed in NIH Reporter. And so if you go to NIH Reporter and type in FI2, you can see the different types of research that NIGMS is funding through the Pratt program. When you're applying for NIH, you need to go to what is called the application guide. And so uh, that is at grants.nih.gov. And particularly, you're going to be using the fellowship application form F. So version F of the application instructions are what you're going to be using as you apply to the Pratt program. There are different versions that happen through time. And right now, we're using form F. And so this is an example of what the uh, funding announcement looks like if you haven't yet looked at it. Uh, it'll tell you the different components, so NIH and NIGMS. And then again, there are related notices. So the first and the last one are really just notices about this webinar. But sometimes, like the second notice from March 10th says, hey, use, use Forms F um, to make sure that you're using the right application instructions. And so the print application due date is October 2nd, 2020. Um, it will be reviewed next spring, and then the early start date will be uh, late summer, early fall, typically September 1st, but occasionally we can start people a little bit earlier in August. 
And so one thing that's really important is that if you're really excited to apply to the program, NIH makes awards from one institution to another institution. And so you as a postdoc cannot by yourself apply. You have to work with a designated person at the institute when we propose to do the work. And that person is called the AOR, the Authorized Organization Representative. So if you are at NICHD, for example, Child Health and Human Development, you will work with Dr. Yvette Pittman and the training office there to make sure that your application gets submitted with all the right credentials and all the right time. This is a person that you're going to want to work with. You want to contact them early in the process. If you haven't done that already, I would suggest after the webinar that you do go ahead and contact them right now. Um, and then we will um, go ahead and you can get yourself started and set up to apply for the process. They will submit your application on your behalf. Um, they have information. They can help you set up your ERA Commons account and make sure that your PIs and sponsors have them. Um, and again, you're going to work with this person to upload your application. And just a bit of terminology before I keep going. Um, the institute where you perform the work, for example, NIMH or NICHD, is the applicant. They apply to NIGMS. You, the postdoc, are the PI. There are not multi-PIs for these awards, but you will be the PI. And then your preceptor is the sponsor. And you can have multiple sponsors. It's important to ensure that all requirements of the FOA or the funding opportunity announcement are met. Incomplete applications are returned without review. Each year this happens, and it's really quite sad for me and for you all because you spent so much work on it, but because you didn't complete the application, it can't be forwarded to peer review. Um, it's important to demonstrate the integration of the research and training component, uh, as well as your training potential, and again, contact your AOR early in the process. So one difference between the Pratt Fellowship and your extramural F32 is what we call a leadership statement. Again, a goal of the program is to prepare people for leadership positions in the biomedical research workforce. And so we ask people to write a one-page leadership statement. So that describes your own past leadership and service activities in the scientific community or to enhance public engagement and understanding of scientific research. Uh, we ask fellows to describe their commitment to diversity in the biomedical sciences and your leadership to mentoring, outreach, and other activities to enhance diversity, especially among groups that are underrepresented in the biomedical research enterprise. And we ask for planned activities during the fellowship to develop or enhance your leadership skills. Again, we want you all to be thinking intentionally about are there resources either through your scientific society, through your research group, through the Office of Intramural Training and Education, or other, other ways that you can enhance your leadership skills so that when you leave um, the Pratt program at NIH, you're well positioned to go on to any position that you would like to attain. And remember, the Pratt leadership statement is a required component of the Pratt application. Applications without the leadership statement will not be reviewed, and this happened to a couple of applicants last year, which is just, it's just sad. You spent all that time um, on the application, so make sure that you include that statement. So now I'm going to talk about some, app, some tips for successful review. There are five different review criteria for fellowship applications, and I'll talk a little bit about each of them and what reviewers tend to look for when they are um, looking at reviewing applications. So first is the fellowship applicant, you. It's really important that you tell your own story. Um, clearly articulate career goal and think about who you are, where you come from, where you want to go, and why is the Pratt mechanism the right mechanism to help you get there, right? And so that can talk about both your um, scientific background, uh, personal background where relevant, but really thinking about what goal do you have when you finish your training, and then how does this program help you get there? It's really important to think about also your sponsors, collaborators, and consultants. And so these are going to be your mentors. Um, it's really important that they provide a detailed and tailored plan for you as it relates to your mentorship and your career development, career advancement. Um, just having a number of highly cited scientists as part of the advisory committee for you, for example, or as mentors, is not helpful if it's clear that they're just listed kind of as an honorific and they haven't thought in deeply about how they're going to use their expertise to further your career and your career advancement. Um, if there are multiple mentors, explain how they'll work together for your training. Um, they should describe, they should have a robust training plan, um, and those that have extensive training records should uh, be able to speak about those as well. So if you have an early career uh, faculty member as your sponsor, you want to make sure they have robust plans and might even think about um, coordinating with other faculty who have additional experience mentoring postdocs for your benefit. That is the current NIH biosketch. Um, and importantly, a collaborator should provide a letter of support, which is different from a reference letter. 
Each person has one role in the application. Some people are your sponsors or collaborators who will be part of the project, part of your research training, whereas other people are going to be references to say, hey, I know this person from their grad work, and this is their character, their ethic, their creativity. Those are different people. Um, you want to make sure you keep each role straight. The research training plan is important, and this is where people spend a lot of um, a lot of effort, importantly. Um, and so the significance, you want to think about particularly significance um, and approach, right? And so you have to have a clear rationale, um, and that can be from the literature or preliminary data that support feasibility. Um, I know that some of you all are graduate students who aren't yet here, and so you, of course, cannot have um, collected your own preliminary data. But you can use either preliminary data from the research group that informs your project, data that you collected as a graduate student, or really the literature to say, this is why this is an important project. And then you really want to think about what the central hypothesis that you have is, in addition to any specific hypotheses. Applications that have a clear hypothesis and then they have clear experiments and test those hypotheses tend to do well. Those that don't have a clear hypothesis tend to not do as well in peer review. For your approach, it's important that it's ambitious but not unrealistic. You don't want to propose uh, two R01s worth of work for a three-year fellowship application. Um, aims should be related but not interdependent, meaning that you don't want to say, I'm going to discover this gene in, in, in AIM-1 and then characterize it in AIM-2 because if, and, and then test it functionally in AIM-3 because if you cannot complete AIM-1, then AIM-2 and 3 can't happen and the whole project comes undone. You want to discuss expected outcomes, potential challenges, and alternative strategies that you'll address when you meet those challenges. Uh, statistical analysis is really important, so think about sample size, power analysis, and attention to relevant biological variables, such as sex. And you want to avoid jargon. Um, as you can see, we have, as you maybe saw earlier, we have Pratt Fellows from a number of different institutes. We have different areas from neuroscience to RNA biology to uh, molecular physiology and, and even looking at using dogs as a model for um, human cancer. So we have a wide variety of scientists that review these applications. You want to make sure that you can both speak to an expert and speak to a generally informed scientist who doesn't know all the jargon in your field. Training potential is incredibly important. So this is a training award, so there needs to be a clear training benefit. For example, a new system, a new technique, or a new set of skills you plan to learn. This can include programs through OITE, um, the FAES, which is a graduate school that's attached to NIH and has a number of different courses available, as well as conferences. It should include track program activities. Again, we meet about twice a month for two to four hours, so you want to just build that into the schedule. And then importantly, the last criteria for review is the institutional environment and commitment to training. So really think about why is this the best environment to conduct the proposed research training. The entire application is reviewed. So a rigorous research proposal is necessary, but it is not sufficient for comparative peer reviews through the Pratt program. Um, I'm going to hammer a couple points, and then we'll move to the fellows. So criteria for application withdrawal. Um, so for any application due date, a multiple applications with the same primary sponsor are going to be withdrawn. So what does that mean? Let's say I'm interested in working in Dr. Salazar's lab, and then my colleague, who's also in Dr. Salazar's lab, we, also, we both want to apply to Pratt. Only one of us can apply this cycle. The doctor, if both of us, me and another colleague, both apply with Dr. Salazar as the primary sponsor, then both those applications will be returned without review because we only will fund one per lab per cycle, and we don't want to have you go through the effort of putting together an application that cannot be funded. However, Dr. Salazar can be my primary mentor and then be a secondary mentor for another person. And that's a, that, that is an option. And so the issue is just having Dr. Salazar be the primary mentor for two applications in the same cycle. If there are missing biosketches for any key personnel, the PI responses, or missing leadership statement, or if there are inappropriate or incomplete letters of reference. And so three letters are required, and key personnel in your application, for example, Dr. Salazar being my sponsor, cannot provide a reference letter. She'll provide a statement as part of the application. So the reference letters are through ERA.gov, um, and the process requires that the referee have your ERA Commons ID. So if you don't have that yet, make sure you have that. Um, the first and last name as they appear in your Commons account, and then the funding opportunity announcement, which is PAR 19286. Letters can be submitted well in advance of the application being submitted. So I encourage you to ask early. 
um, and make sure they are submitted. Each year, there's a person or two who does not have enough reference letters, and then their application gets withdrawn. Um, the letters are due at 5 p.m. on the due date, and there's no grace period. So please, please, please get them in on time. Um, and again, just to close this up, make sure you give yourself enough time to identify a mentor, work on the proposal, and work with the AOR on the logistics of submission. Make sure your application is complete, where does the reference, file sketches, leadership statement, among the other components. Um, and make sure uh, you will submit the application in October, but it'll probably be reviewed in, in February or March. And so during that time, the scientific review officer will reach out to you to say, are there any relevant updates? And so if you have a new manuscript that has been submitted, or sorry, that's been accepted for publication, that's an example of something that you want to send in so that people who are reviewing get a full sense of your record. Okay, so I've talked about 30 minutes. Um, and now I'm really excited to have you all hear from the Pratt Fellows. And so we are, there are four fellows, Dr. Sarah young Bayer, who does her work at NICHD, Dr. Chase Francis, who does his work at NIDA, Dr. Adina Lee Gleason, who does her work at NHGRI, and Dr. Elizabeth Martin. Um, and so each of them can go for a few minutes, and um, I can let each of you, you all can just unmute yourself, Sarah, Chase, Adina Lee, and Elizabeth, and then you all can go, and then we'll move on to questions. Okay, great. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name's Sarah. And I'm, as Kenny said, I'm a postdoc in Tom Devers' lab in the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Um, and I'm broadly interested in understanding how cells respond to both extrinsic and intrinsic stresses. And one of the main ways that cells respond to stress is by modulating gene expression through the regulation of protein synthesis. I first began studying this kind of translation regulation during my doctoral work in Ron Webb's lab at the Indiana University School of Medicine. And as you can see from my uh, prep uh, title there, as a postdoc, I've transitioned into studying disorders that are caused by the misregulation of protein synthesis. And I've largely focused on an X-linked intellectual disability disorder that's termed MIMO syndrome. So I just wanna say I can't express enough how beneficial the Pratt program has been for me and how supportive, especially Kenny, but also the Pratt Fellows have been throughout my time at NIH. Uh, as Kenny mentioned, we typically meet as a group twice a month. And in most meetings, a second year Pratt Fellow will give a research-based presentation. And that's followed by a presentation um, from that particular Fellows invited speaker. Since the Pratt Fellows have diverse career interests, we get to hear from invited speakers that are leaders in academia, industry, small biotech, and government, among others. Um, and the invited speakers mostly talk about their particular career path. And these talks have really opened my eyes to both the different career possibilities that are available to us as postdocs, but also what skill sets we should be developing now to go down a particular career path. And I think Kenny has done a really amazing job at making sure that we have the opportunity to participate in career development activities that really focus on um, diverse types of careers. So in my case, I'm interesting, interested in running a research lab at a research intensive university. And one of the career development opportunities that I participated in was a mock K99 R00 review panel. And the mock review panel was incredibly helpful and I was able to use what I learned from our discussion and apply it to my own K99 proposal uh, that was fortunately funded this past fall. Uh, Kenny also recently organized a couple of practice chalk talk sessions for the Pratt Fellows that are interested in academia. So those of us that participated gave formal chalk talks to a panel of six NIH PIs, and they questioned us throughout the, the chalk talk and afterwards provided feedback. The PIs were all from really diverse research backgrounds, and I found the chalk talks to be incredibly informative, both in terms of overall format, format but also how research questions should be presented um, and framed in order to interest a diverse audience. We also hold an annual press symposium where the outgoing third years present the research and invite one or two keynote speakers. And this year I got to co-organize the symposium with one of the other outgoing third years. And it was a great leadership opportunity for me and I'm really excited to hear from our two keynotes at our symposium this fall. So in closing, I'll just say that I feel so lucky to have participated in the Pratt program, in large part because of Kenny's efforts, this fellowship has been 
a truly useful and enjoyable experience uh, for me. So I guess Chase, you're next up. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Chase Francis. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and I'm entering my third year as a Pratt Fellow, which means I'm entering the last year of the Pratt program, and I have hopes of obtaining a principal investigator position at an academic institution. So I obtained my PhD at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and I'm currently in the lab of Dr. Maricela Morales studying motivational circuits in the brain that underlie aversive condition responses in mice. Uh, the Pratt program has been extremely beneficial to me um, and it's provided me with a number of benefits as a postdoctoral fellow at the NIH. For me, I think the biggest benefit is that the Pratt acts as a financial and social support system. And uh, since the Pratt funds your salary directly, you have the freedom to explore opportunities outside of bench science, among other op opportunities that are really just limited to your imagination. Uh, for me, it gave me a peace of mind that I would be funded as I transitioned to a new lab recently at NIDA. Um, and it should also be noted that Kenny acts as a second mentor to fellows in the program. And it's always there to help you develop career structure, guide your path, and help you make plans for the future. Uh, additionally, on a regular basis, I'm able to connect with a, a community of like-minded driven scientists, all the other Pratt fellows uh, that have a diverse set of ideas and backgrounds across most NIH institutes, both inside and outside of my field of study. And uh, this pr proved to be extremely helpful when I performed a mock chalk talk, as Sarah had mentioned, uh, in front of the Pratt Fellows and NIH investigators as a way of practicing and getting feedback for a notoriously difficult uh, part of an academic job interview. Lastly, the Pratt program provides significant insight into the workings of NIH, which you might not get in other places. Um, and as you know, NIH is the major, uh, major funding institute for biological and health sciences. Um, and this includes Insight into grants and new initiatives and policies. So in this regard, and aside from all the workshops and training um, that we get, we attend regular lunchtime discussions with the director of NIGMS, John Lorsch, who encourages uh, and notes trainees' opinions, worries, and wishes for the NIH. So it's kind of like a direct funnel to the admins of NIH. Uh, and the last thing I'll say that if you're on the fence about writing the grant, uh, writing the grant itself provides experience with writing and routing grants, um, and you'll get good feedback on your science, as, as Kenny had mentioned. So there really are no true negatives other than the time it takes you uh, to applying for this program. Thanks, Chase, and I didn't relate. Uh, you can go next. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. All right. So my name is Adenerle Gleason, and I, um, I'm just completing my second year in the Pratt program. And so I obtained my PhD in cell and developmental biology. And um, the central theme of my uh, doctoral work was to examine the nexus that exists between signal transduction pathways and endocytic trafficking. And as such, I gained, uh, I have a strong background in model organism genetics, microscopy, and biochemistry. And so using um, that tool set, I came to the NIH and received the Pratt Award. And uh, my project was um, basically looking at how distinct chromatin regions influence cell cycle. And one of the novelties of the Pratt program is that, that I'd like to emphasize is uh, number one, transitions, is, as Chase mentioned. And um, so um, with the help of the program, was I was able to transition into a lab because my research focus changed and examine how uh, lysosomal storage disorders um, through a very clinical lens. And I joined Dr. Ellen Sedrancy's lab in, over at NHGRI. And I'm now currently studying how, the, or the underlying mechanisms that give rise to the phenotypic diversity, which is seen in Gaucher disease. And to address this question, um, I'm taking a bioinformatics approach and genomics approach to kind of identify modifiers in the disease. And again, I'd like to emphasize that the PrEP program gave me the opportunity to fill the knowledge gap. So I was taking courses throughout um, this spring to catch up on my bioinformatics training. And another unique um, component that separates the Pratt pro program from uh, other postdoctoral training awards is the mentorship and networking opportunities that were mentioned previously. And so throughout the program, you, you're going and attending numerous uh, seminars where you're engaging with faculty members from diverse research institutions and 
those seminars are filled with talks where you can talk to program officers that spearhead different um, funding announcements and so or funding awards. And so I'd like to convey that you, convey that you have a firsthand account on uh, what it is or what it takes to transition into the academic sector. And I'd like to also mention that um, you, it also you can this not only applies to the academic sector, but it also um, you it, you basically have the opportunity to explore other careers in government and industry. So as a postdoc in the pro um, as a Pratt Fellow in the program, you have a heightened sense of awareness, and you really gain like a true perspective on how um, the necessary steps that are needed to take to whatever career that you desire. And so I agree with my fellows that you know this program is has been really instrumental in my career development, and um, you have the opportunity to succeed in in whatever you'd like to do. Thanks. Finally, last but certainly not least, Dr. Elizabeth Martin uh, from uh, NIEHS. Hi. Um, so, like Kenny said, I'm Elizabeth, um, and uh, I want to echo all of my colleagues and say that the Pratt program is absolutely a wonderful opportunity, and you should absolutely apply. Um, so I got my PhD from UNC Chapel Hill um, in a slightly different field, environmental science and engineering. And my work was focused on um, how early life exposure to various environmental toxicants are related to later life disease. So a lot of my research focused on toxicological risk related to epigenetic changes as a mechanism of developing disease later in life. But one of the things I found um, through my research is that we don't know a ton about how um, epigenetic change is actually written by these toxicants. So some of the research I'm interested in is how transcription factors interact with toxicants, which I know a good bit about. But then the other piece that I came to NIH to study is how transcription factors then interact with the epigenome to create these kind of causal changes. So my research at NIEHS is focused on how windows of exposure, specifically pregnancy, um, and the interaction between progesterone receptor as a transcription factor can rewrite the epigenome. So I think that this was made possible in part by the Pratt program because when I came to my mentor's lab, he does a ton of work. So Dr. Paul Wade does a ton of work on how um, transcription factors interact with the epigenome, but he's not super interested in pregnancy. So it allowed me to branch off in a slightly different direction to understand um, the interactions between transcription factors and the epigenome. Uh, additionally, the PrEP program has been fantastic because you have an additional pot of funding to go to conferences. So I'm still able to go to toxicology conferences um, and developmental origins of health and disease conferences that I wouldn't have been able to go to if I had just come to the lab. Um, and lastly, I want to echo all of my um, fellow fellows and say that um, Kenny is an amazing resource. So I have an interest in environmental justice. Um, and putting more molecular measures to some of these environmental justice outcomes. And Kenny has been super helpful at helping me find um, avenues and ways to kind of look at that, um, as well as other people in the program, being able to talk to them about my ideas and what they think. So I just want to say that you should definitely apply. Thank you all so much. Um, hopefully, if you're still there, you can see we have fellows a couple of wide variety of backgrounds, do lots of different things, and so ideally, Hopefully, if you're looking, you can find yourself um, a home in the PrEP program. And even if you're not in the PrEP program at NIH, um, NIH in general. So, um, and there's one, if you could everybody please turn off your video, that would be uh, great as well. Um, and let's see, so I'm going to do a couple things. Um, I'm going to finish with this recruitment, and then we'll take questions. I see some in the chat already. Um, so the deadline is October 2nd of this year. Um, peer review will happen next spring. Um, you get notified May or June, and then you start next uh, next uh, September. Again, you can make sure to check out the PrEP homepage and the funding opportunity announcement, as well as follow us at NIGMS Training. And feel free to email me if you have any questions that aren't answered here. I'm happy to reply. Um, and then really one last thing. Um, Let's say you say, okay, that sounds great, but I really want to be at a place other than NIH. Um, I want to make sure you're aware there are a number of different extramural NIH training opportunities for postdocs. And so those include uh, NIGMS has an entire division for training, workforce development, and diversity. And so be sure to check out our webpage, NIGMS 
TWD, um, to see different opportunities that exist. Uh, those include extramural fellowships, F32s, our IRACTA program, um, which is a, another cohort-based postdoc program, but it also has a teaching component, often with um, institutions that have a mission to serve uh, historically underrepresented uh, or marginalized populations, as well as our research supplements programs to promote diversity. And so those are three great opportunities uh, where you, the supplement program, you work to write a specific application to have additional funding with an NIH-funded investigator. Um, and he said that NIGMS is great, but my interest is elsewhere. Look at the extramural research training website. And so this is the fellow, these are the fellows of the group that uh, we hope to have many of you join. And I'm going to um, take questions now. Let's see. So let's look at the chat. And I think I can see this in school. And again, please be sure to turn off your video if you have it on. Okay. So there are a lot of different questions, and I will try to bend some of them. Um, and ask the fellows to answer some that are appropriate for them. Uh, so, will the webinar be available later? Yes. Uh, check back to the Pratt website uh, in the next uh, week or two. It'll be made available later. Um, do you have to complete all three full years as prescribed? So, the goal is for a three-year program. If you know that you only have one year of training here, it probably doesn't make the most sense to apply. But again, uh, feel free to follow up with me and we can talk about specifics. Um, so, uh, looking at uh, uh, those who have specific backgrounds, I think if you have a specific question, um, about your own uh, research and does it fit, I encourage you to email me a specific AIMS page. Um, uh, uh, the, the person who asked about um, uh, pain interventions and biomarkers that likely work, but an AIMS page is going to be super helpful. So if you come up with an AIMS page and send that to me, I can give you a sense of whether or not that'd be appropriate for the Pratt program. Um, and yes, um, because we fund through the ERDA mechanism, the Intramural Research Training Award mechanism, which is only available to U.S. citizens and permanent residents, you have to be a U.S. citizen and permanent resident to apply. Um, so this is a question. What percentage of PrEP fellows have gone on to have their KI-9 funded? We don't have a specific target rate, but each year, usually one to, one to three fellows um, go on to get their KI-9s uh, supported. And I know that, um, for example, some past fellows have uh, donated their application materials to current fellows. So I don't know if Chase or Sarah, you have any thoughts as it relates to writing the K99 and, and the extent to which um, the program was helpful or even your peers in the program were helpful during that process? Yeah, um, I would say that in terms of writing the K99, my Pratt um, proposal was definitely definitely laid the groundwork for that and the format is very similar so um i found both applying to the pratt to be useful but then i think it's also beneficial on your k grant to show that you have been funded before i get the impression that reviewers uh, view that as a positive thing um i would say that for me since we are such a diverse group of fellows um in my second year presentation, I really did take a step back and think about uh, how to present some of my research. And that came through on the K99 too. I definitely changed my language a little bit to be um, a little more um, available to people that were maybe outside of my specific field. Um, and I'll, this is Chase, uh, I'll echo Sarah um, and say that my Pratt um, grant was actually the foundation for my K99 as well. It just easily led right into the research for my K99. Um, the other thing that I thought that was really, really helpful was because we do have people in the program that are successful at obtaining K99, we were able to get those specific successful K99s from Kenny um, that we could use as templates in some cases for certain uh, portions and parts. And the uh, because um, the Pratt Fellows come from such a diverse background, you have K99s that are from a clinical background all the way to you know, basic research background. So you really have a lot of different templates to work off. 
Great, yeah. And again, it's many Pratt fellows are generous and say, hey, you send this to other fellows. And so, um, again, part of it is being part of a community, and that's really one of the fields we're trying to have. Um, how many Pratt fellows are there at any given time? So currently we're at 25. Uh, each year we admit seven to 10 fellows, and asking about success rates, usually somewhere in the, you know, it depends on the number of applications we have each year. Um, again, it's restricted to people who are working within the intramural program, so it's not the whole world, but typically somewhere between, it's very the last five years, between 18 and 25% of people who apply get the award. That depends on the number of people who apply, the number of slots we have that year. Um, typically, again, we admit uh, seven to 10 people each year into the program. It's gone up in recent years as we had more um, applicants apply. And this is not an NRSA award. So NRSA is a National Research Service Award that funds extramural um, funding opportunities, such as the F32, F awards and um, T awards, so training grants. Um, but this is modeled on the F32 application with some modifications, including the leadership statement, but for fellows that are within the intramural research program. Yeah, so then the question is, what advice do you have for grant students who want to apply? And so on this, on this, um, on this uh, list of fellows, uh, at least two of them applied as grad students, Agnes Karasik and uh, uh, Lara uh, Pomato. Um, and so I, I think the same advice for grad students is what I have for those who are here. Um, but you have the extra uh, step of making sure that you find a mentor and work with a person who's really interested in you and your career development and that you work to come up with a robust uh, research plan. And um, I think one thing that's interesting, and, and, for all NIH awards, I say don't be discouraged, right? Because sometimes you don't, sometimes you get on the first shot and sometimes you don't. One of the fellows who's in the program this year actually applied last year as a grad student. The application wasn't discussed and this year got a perfect score. Um, and so put your ideas down. I think um, as Chase mentioned, it really helps you to hone your scientific ideas, hone your career trajectory. Um, so if you're a graduate student, make sure you find a mentor who's really interested in you, whose work you're interested in contributing to. Um, and then work with the institute uh, training officer and signing official to make sure you get your application submitted. Again, if you have additional questions, please feel free to email me um, specifically. Um, the application, anybody with a doctoral degree has a, has an, has a chance to um, participate in this program. So that could be a PhD or MD. Recently, we haven't had MDs apply. Um, in the history of the program, there was once a focus on pharmacology, but currently it's, it's broader. But if you're an MD, who plan to do uh, basic research within the NIGMS mission, you're able to apply, again, strictly clinical, strictly behavioral, strictly population science tends to be outside. Um, but again, a theme that I, I've made a couple of times, if you think you're interested in, in applying, um, send me an AIMS page, even a rough one. Um, with, and then we can assess the potential fit for the program. Um, and again, there's a question about specific background. So it's less important what your, your specific background is, but the research that you're proposing. And maybe Elizabeth, um, or even generally, you could talk a little bit about how um, either as part of the application or as part of your fellowship, you transition. Because once you, you apply and you're accepted, we really accept you and invest in you. But um, Elizabeth specifically, maybe you could talk a little bit about your transition um, and how the Pratt helped you to um, transition and hone some additional skills. Yeah, sure. So um, my training was primarily in population-based epigenetics research and toxicological risk assessment. Um, so the translation of that is that I worked with large human population data sets using um, array-based technologies to look at epigenetic measures in human populations and relating them. So a lot of things I looked at were things like preeclamptic versus normotensive women during pregnancy and changes to placental methylation. Or I would look at um, babies who were exposed to arsenic and changes to cord blood level methylation in their um, cords. So 
I didn't have a ton of like wet bench skills. I didn't have a ton, uh, like, so I can extract like DNA and RNA and protein, but that was pretty much the extent of my wet bench skills. So the PrEP program, um, I think, gave me a little bit of peace of mind that going into a completely new and different area in science, um, where I'm focusing on like sequencing techniques and um, actually doing molecular and mouse experiments and things uh, was well supported. Sorry, my dogs are growling in the background. Um, but yeah, it was definitely super comforting to know that um, somebody thought that I could do this research and transition successfully. And I think having that um, feeling like, okay, somebody believes that I can do this um, was super helpful. And then Adairole, maybe you could talk about projects evolving from your initial proposal, because again, you've transitioned as part of your time in the PrEP program um, and just sort of, um, you know, your experience with that. Absolutely. Um, so it was um, in my second year where I made the transition and the, um, and with the time that I had left in the PrEP program, uh, I kind of was looking at my tool set and trying to identify what um, new avenues of research I could ask, but I haven't really, um, or, or kind of like what I was lacking. And so I had a very basic background in my uh, um, PhD work. And so I kind of wanted to, you know, try out um, a more clinical perspective. And so the link was, I was in endocytic trafficking. And so I kind of looked for labs that were examining that kind of question. In, in a clinical lens, and that's how I found Ellen Sadransky. And so as I dug deeper, um, you know, she had a, a cohort of, of patient data that needed to kind of um, be sorted out. And um, so I had this the skill set, um, you know, the background from the, the trafficking background, but actually adding the bioinformatics and the genomics, and even being able to um, work with some of the patients is, is, was a new thing for me. So those were kind of, it took me a while to kind of make that transition and, and, and make sure that this was the right, um, direction. But now that I'm in it, I'm, you know, really excited about, um, the prospects that this career trajectory has to offer because I can still, you know, have an academic, do science, clinical science and an academic, um, perspective. And also I have the opportunities to kind of go into industry. Great. Um, well, answer a few more questions uh, so we can uh, keep the time. Um, biomedical engineering projects, yes, they can be a great fit. One of our alumni fellow, Dr. Amy Elliott, um, she had a joint project between the National Institute of Mental Health and National Institute uh, for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, NIBIB. And what she did was she built a microscope to look at the circuits of fly brains. And so biomedical engineering can definitely be appropriate. Um, Nathan Williamson, he has a kind of material science background, so he's looking at the property of fluids with the idea of using that to inform MRIs to detect um, things like prostate cancer or, um, or or challenges during pregnancy. So definitely, we can do we can we can we can um, accommodate a, a wide number of areas of science. Um, in terms of publications, um, there's not a strict requirement. Most Pratt fellows have you know, uh, at least one or two first author publications, but again, that can be consistent with, that can even be things like preprint. And it's relative to where you are in your space. And so if you're applying during the second year of your postdoc, there's a different expectation than if you're applying as a final year PhD student, um, because you might not have been able to publish your work yet. And so this goes to the idea of do not self-eliminate, put your application together. And that's another point to reiterate that um, preprints are, an acceptable manner to show productivity on your NIH biosket. So uh, I encourage those who have the work um, and it's not yet out from the journal, but you've done the work to consider submitting a preprint as well. Um, if you will be a permanent resident by the time of the start date, you would be able to apply. And so you need to be um, a U.S. citizen or permanent resident by the time of the start date. It's typical for many NIH type awards. Um, uh, and again, if you don't yet have a lab, that's fine. You need to identify a mentor. Um, 
and then work with that mentor to um, submit an application for this fall. Uh, and then you would start next fall. So um, I know many times people look a year out for their postdoc and it's and I granting processes take a while, but this would be a great opportunity to say, you know, if you want to work with them in their lab and they want to put the application together with you, by all means, please identify a mentor and go for it. Um, and just to clarify, um, you don't have to be here already, but the mentor has to agree to write the application. So the mentor who is at NIH must say, I will support this person um, as a fellow in my lab. Um, yes, if you plan to apply fall 2021, please uh, consider applying. And uh, again, for specific questions, follow with me, kenneth.gib at nih.gov uh, with your specific questions um, and AIMS pages, and we can think about how to make sure you um, are aware of the program, as well as other training opportunities that NIH has to offer. Um, stipends are available um, at uh, through the OITE webpage, and so there's a stipend scale that NIH uses. Um, Pratt fellows receive an additional uh, bonus consistent with having competed for um, a competitive fellowship, and they have a travel and training allowance of about $3,000 per year. Um, And again, we encourage uh, we encourage uh, people to take the career track that they think is important to them. And so, again, uh, many of them are in academia. But if we go back to the earlier slide, you'll see in the last 15 years, about 40% are in academia, 30% are in government, 20% in industry, 10% in um, additional careers. I don't know if any of the fellows want to speak specifically about um, access to uh, or thoughts about access either through Pratt or through OIT around learning about the breadth of careers that a person with science training um, can take. Hey, uh, everyone, this is Sarah. I guess um, I've gone to several of the OITE events as well as the uh, Pratt events. They certainly emphasize the full range of um, careers that are out there. I've actually found the Pratt events to be the most helpful. And I think that's because, you know, you're in a room with a speaker that has a particular career path and it may be something you've never heard of before, but you can ask them very pointed questions about, you know, how they got to their particular uh, job and what skill sets are required to get to that kind of job. So, um, while I'm personally going down the academic path, um, it was something that I've definitely labored on, especially after um, having these interactions with people, because there are so many different uh, careers that we can all be successful in. Great. Um, I'll, I'll do a little rapid fire so we can um, release people's time. Um, and so the question is, how do you find the NIH Institute and signing official? And so what you have to do is find your mentor. The mentor, the mentors I see will determine who the signing official is, right? And so um, many of the intramural programs uh, have broad levels of research. And so you can have basic biophysics at NIDDK or neurodevelopment at either NICHD, neuro mental health, or um, NINDS. And so what you want to do is make sure that you're looking for the institute where your sponsor works and then work with that person who will be the AOR. So the sponsor is at NICHD, NICHD is the signing official submitting at institute the NINDS, that's where the person is. And the biggest difference between a postdoc at the NIH versus in a university setting, maybe some of uh, the other fellows, um, uh, Chase or Elizabeth or Demerle can talk about um, why you chose to postdoc at NIH as opposed to postdoc in academia. Hey, this is Elizabeth. So I actually have a year of experience in an uh, academic lab as well as um, at NIEHS, um, some years at NIEHS. And one of the biggest things that I think is fantastic about NIH is um, if you find the right sponsor um, and you ask questions that are of interest to both you and your sponsor, the level of experiment that you can plan is wild. So you have access to research 
services funding that you don't have the same level of access, at least in my experience, to in academic research. So, for example, if I want to sequence, you know, six runs looking at changes in histone um, acetylation, I can do that. Whereas if I was at an academic institute, I'd probably do qPCR and then sequence a condition based on my qPCR results. So the like breadth of science that you can do, like time courses and all kinds of studies, um, is wild. Like it's let your imagination run. You can come up with anything you want to, um, for sure. Um, this is a general A, and I just actually want to echo that that comment. Um, so I was, uh, my PhD, as I said, I was in a state institution, and so when I was looking for postdocs, I was um, pleasantly surprised at the amount of, again, resources that you have your um, hands on. And so my background a lot was of microscopy, a lot of microscopy work I've done. And so the, just the number of microscopes that you have access to is unlimited. Um, the proteomics facilities, mass spec, um, the sequencing facilities, everything is just at your disposal. Um, and so it really gives you the opportunity to ask very um, high high profile questions because you have the tools to available to you. Uh, hey, this um, is, oh, go, go ahead, Jay. Sorry, so I just want to uh, echo what they both said. The amount of resources are unlimited. Um, but what I'll say is that when I was choosing a postdoc, I didn't choose to come to the NIH. I actually chose for my mentor. Um, and I'll give you like a, a secondary side on this. I was from some people that had already worked at the NIH, they're like, there's a lot of bureaucracy, but you know, the level of research you can do at these institutes pales in comparison to the amount of bureaucracy that you have to deal with. It is it is insane and it is incredible. Money is no object. And that's that's all I'll say. Uh, thank you. And of course, that comes with great stewardship to see their taxpayer dollars. Um, but there are a number of resources that are devoted, um, particularly given the unique role that NIH plays in the nation's health and wellness. Uh, I'm going to finish these last two questions and then thank you all. And uh, feel free to follow up with more emails. So uh, the question is uh, essentially, I have other funding mechanisms. Am I eligible for this? So if you are a postdoc, if you're planning to do a postdoc at the NIH, you are eligible. Um, if this is going to be a second postdoc, particularly if you had uh, three or four years of postdoc experience extramurally, tends to be um, you have to think about uh, the training potential, and so you're definitely eligible. Uh, and again, follow up individually, um, but you might even think about if you've had three or four years of postdoc experience extramurally applying for a K award, which might be more appropriate to helping you move on to launch an independent career. Um, and so you can't necessarily transfer from an F32 to this or a T32 to this, but if you're a graduate student on a T32 program, you definitely should consider applying and list that as some of your funding. So um, I hope uh, that you found this interesting and uh, useful. Let's see, and these are the fellows, uh, a great group to be a part of. Hope to see your face here next year. So thank you so much for listening. Good luck with your application. Please follow up with me, kenneth.gibbs at nih.gov or tweet us at NIGMS training and um, Best of luck to you as you move forward in your career. Take care. Bye-bye.